you can be turning to Revelation chapter 3, starting in verse 7. I uh, moved to New Orleans as a teenager, and so like I was, that's where Jackie and I met, by the way, and so when I was uh, like 15, 16, I was upstairs playing with my little brother, his name is Barry, and we had this army trunk, and uh, <clears throat> You know how brothers do. I decided it would be cool if Barry would get in the trunk. And, you know, I mean, I don't know how to say this, but I like closed the trunk on him. Well, you know, it had one of those brass things that come down like that, and it locked. So, I mean, I, you know, at 16, I was cool. It didn't, that, uh, and so I, I, I couldn't get it open. And my little brother was in the trunk. And <clears throat> so I walked down the stairs. And I just, you know, really cool. You know, when you're 16, you, you know, you don't get excited about, especially not excited about locking your brother in the trunk. So I just walked down the, down the stairs and I said, hey, Mom, um, do we have a key to that trunk up there? And, and uh, she said, well, no, we haven't had a key to that trunk for a long time. And so I said, I said, um, man, um, <laughs> well, it's like Barry's in the trunk, and I can't get the trunk open. Well, put yourself in her place. I mean, she kind of went crazy. Ran up there, started going crazy, kept going crazy. And, uh, <clears throat> and you know, we had, and, and now keep in mind, I, I, I wasn't raised in Central with the cornerstone mentality. You know, I, I wasn't raised driving tractors and chainsaws and using tools and everything. I mean, my dad never taught me how to do that kind of stuff. And so the, he was home, but I mean, we were just clueless as to what to do. So we called the fire engine. We called the fire station because my, my mother was convinced that Barry was going to gonna, um, suffocate. And I mean, I, I was pointing, Mom, look right there. This is not this solid wood trunk, you know. It, it, you can see light. And he said, I can see light. I can see light. I can breathe. So we called the fire department, and, and, and one of us, I can't remember who it was, we ran next door, and maybe they remembered that the McGinn's next door had a, had a trunk. And so we knocked on the door, and Mr. McGinn came, and he has a trunk, and he came in with the key, and the key opened the trunk, and Barry got out, you know, and we all kind of laughed about the closed door and the key, and Mr. McGinn it, ha having the key. I mean, like, evidently, any key to any trunk fits any trunk. So now you know that. Don't feel very safe when you lock your trunk. So we're sitting in our living room, you know, and about three minutes later, you know, we were kind of laughing. Everything was fine. Of course, we get a knock on the door. It's the fire department, and we had forgotten to call the thing off, you know. H how many of you have funny stories, perhaps, that you have in your memory about locked doors and <laughs> having to go to your neighbors or, you know, all these kind of things? Uh, Revelations chapter 3 talks about, a, about keys and, and doors and open doors. And, and I, I feel like God wants to impress upon this church today that he has a key and he's going to use it to open doors. Amen? And um, let's look at Revelation chapter 3 starting in verse 7. I want to read the whole passage. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, and then I, I, we're just going to focus on two verses in the passage. Now, you, you might, just a, a word of background, in Revelation chapter 1 is kind of the introduction to the whole book, and it talks about Jesus and how Jesus is alive, amen? Everybody say, Jesus is alive. And in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, if, if you're familiar with the book, <clears throat> Jesus writes seven letters, amen, to seven churches, and these are real churches and Jesus knows all about those churches, and he writes these seven letters. And he addresses them to the angel or the pastor, perhaps, of the, of the church. And so, periodically over my career as a pastor-type guy, 
I've thought, you know, where would our church fit? And I'm going to give you a couple of reasons why I think, but I, I want to suggest to you that Cornerstone could be closest aligned to the church in Philadelphia. And I, we don't have all the verses on the board. We have the first couple of verses. But I, I want to read the whole letter to the church in Philadelphia. And it starts in verse 7. Could you all uh, just follow on as I read? To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write. Interestingly enough, when I was 5 to 12, I lived in Philadelphia. And it is known as the city of brotherly love. Philadelphia means city of love. I don't remember it being very much of that. But... Uh, to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These are the words of him who is holy and true. Now, if you have a red letter edition, you notice that all these words are in red. So this is Jesus writing a letter to the church in Philadelphia. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens... No one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and not denied my name. Now, those are the verses we're going to focus on, but I want to read the whole letter. Verse 9, I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Since you have kept my commands to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole earth to test the inhabitants of the earth. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. The one who is victorious, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of our God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on them my new name. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Father God, we know that, Jesus, you are alive today. And you know our hearts. You know our hearts better than we know our hearts. You know the heart of this church, Father God. There's nothing hidden from you. Everything is laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must all give account. So, Lord, we ask your presence to come in a special way as we look at your letter to the church at Philadelphia, as we learn by your Spirit what you're saying to us today. Dear Heavenly Father, we bow once again in your presence and we ask that your word would be our rule and our guide, your Holy Spirit, our teacher, and your greater glory, our supreme concern. In the name of Jesus, amen. Okay, now there's a lot in that letter, and we read a relatively long passage, and I'm going to focus on verse 7 and 8, and then maybe at a later time we could look at the whole letter. But open doors. Jesus said to this church, See, I have placed before you an open door. Now, I want to take a minute. And, and go through the other six churches. I, I'll, I'll do this quickly. Because I, I want you to kind of go through the process with me, how I've come to the conclusion that perhaps Cornerstone would be the church in Philadelphia, and what, the God, what Jesus is saying to Philadelphia, he's saying to Cornerstone. Here's part of my process. Ephesus. So the fir first, first exercise I went through was kind of like the... the, the um, the process of elimination. Ephesus is the first church that got the first letter right there in chapter 2. And this is what, in summary, Jesus said to Ephesus. He said, man, I know your hard work. I know your perseverance, but you've left your first love. So I would like to suggest that that's not cornerstone. 
Now, if you feel like I'm boasting or bragging or even if you think like I'm not being very realistic, I, I don't think that we've left our first love. I mean, I was just thinking what we were singing this morning. I mean, our, we really love God. I, I think, I commend you. I guess that's what I want to do. I commend you. I don't think that like the church at Ephesus, we've forsaken our first love. I think we love Jesus with all our heart. So I, I don't think Ephesus is who we are. And then the second church is Smyrna. And man, God had nothing but commendation for the church at Smyrna, but the key towards Smyrna was, man, you're in the middle of affliction, you're in the middle of suffering, you're poverty, you're rich because of who you are in Christ, but, and he says to them, don't be afraid of what you're about to suffer. Now, I think suffering is going to come at the proper time, but I don't think that's the characteristic of where we find ourselves right now. So, process of elimination, not Ephesus, not Smyrna, and then you get to Pergamum, and what was happening in the church at Pergamum was they were holding on to wrong teaching. And praise God, I, I just don't think we're holding on to wrong teaching. Now, I'm not saying that we're perfect in our theology. Nobody's perfect in theology. When Jesus comes, our theology will be muchly changed. But I don't think that God is looking at our church now and saying, man, you're holding on to some bad teaching. So I cross that off. I get to Thyatira. And what Thyatira was uh, kind of gotten for was they tolerated Jezebel and she misleded or misled many people into adultery and so the issue there was holiness and and again God forbid that I would say oh we're the holy church or we're the most holy church or we're holy but I I, I hope that in our church you know holiness is 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 believed in and is practiced and we're moving forward in holiness so I don't think we're Thyatira. And then Sardis, listen to what the Spirit of God, listen to what Jesus said about Sardis. You have a reputation for being alive, but you're dead. I mean, again, forgive me if you think that that this is uh, uh, any part of of, uh, boasting in something I shouldn't be boasting in, but I just, I I don't think we have, I don't think we're dead. (laughs) Come on. You know, here, raise your hand if you think we're, you know, We're not a dead church. I mean, I feel like we're a live church. So then you get back to Philadelphia. Well, then the the only one left then is Laodicea. And and that was the lukewarm church. And God was about to spit that church out of their mouth if they did not repent. So I had to kind of cross Laodicea off. So we get to to Philadelphia. And and basically what God is saying, man, I have the key. And I'm going to open the door. And, man, I I want you guys to go through that door. Amen? I I believe that's what he's saying. Now, um, that's that's where I could come just by the process of elimination. I mean, let's just say there was no other process but the process of elimination. And by eliminating the other ones, I I come down to, to, man, out of the seven churches, maybe Cornerstone would be Philadelphia. And then I go to the process of observation, right? And the process of observation, I mean, I'm looking around, I'm seeing open doors, amen? Come on, somebody say amen to that, besides my wife. I mean, the observation is I'm looking around and and, and I I see our our worship team leading uh, in a Struma Baptist Church yesterday. It wasn't like our worship team, but it was six of our young men and... um, And man, here they are, they had four or five times of worship with a couple hundred guys in a Baptist church. I mean, to me, that's an open door. They were invited to come do that, and and, and that's an open door. So the process of elimination gets me to Philadelphia, and the process of observation gets me to Philadelphia. I mean, I, I see in my life some open doors, and I see around the church some open doors, and then there's one more process I'll just give you, the process of revelation, and maybe that's the most important. I believe God is showing us and opening our eyes and speaking to our hearts that, man, I have the keys, and I'm going to open the doors, and that's what we call revelation, and when he speaks that to my heart, it's like, "Mm, I want to get ready for the open doors that he's going to open. Is that fair? Okay. Elimination, observation, and revelation point me to if there's one of the seven churches that we identify with, it would be the church in Philadelphia. So let's look at verse 7. These are the words, and you can look at these on the board. These are the words of him who is holy and true. 
praise God. I, I just think that when we read things like that, who is that? That's Jesus. He's holy and he's true. Could we give him a hand? He's holy and he's true. Jesus, your, your analysis of our church is not wrong. You're true. Your analysis of our church is not from inferior motives or anything like that. I mean, you're holy and you're true. The second little phrase, who holds the key of David? Now, the key of David represents authority. I mean, the problem with the trunk is not that, that we, we didn't have the key. I mean, we just, we just couldn't open that trunk. But, but the key, the key represents authority. The key represents the authority of Jesus Christ. And there ain't no door in the whole world that Jesus Christ can't open if that's what he wants to do. And so the key of David represents Christ's authority to open doors. Now, we do not have authority to open doors. Christ has the key, and Christ has the key that opens doors. And when he opens a door, man, we as a body of Christ, or we as individuals, need to be ready to go in the door. Okay, you go on, and it says what? He opens, no one can shut. I mean, we're talking about this powerful, authoritative God who has this omnipotent, omnipresent, omnipotent plan for bringing this world to the end times. And the main thing that's going to happen in the end is that all things are going to be brought under the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, God is going to exalt Jesus above all things. Things, all things are going to come together under Jesus Christ. And so God is the one, Jesus is the one who said in the Great Commission, think of that, all authority has been given to me, therefore go and make disciples of all nations. So the one who has all authority has the key to open the doors and then we must be ready to go through it. What he opens, no one can shut. Just get your faith going a little bit. What he opens, nobody's going to shut. The problem is that the door's not going to be shut. The problem is, are we ready to take advantage of that opportunity, right? Are we mobilized, filled with the Spirit, living right, where we can go through and make the most of that opportunity, where we can take advantage of that open door? What he shuts, no one can open so then we get to verse 8 i know your deeds you know it's kind of silly what we do we try to hide everything and we try to hope people don't find out anything but the one to whom we must give account knows everything and so he knows the deeds of the church he knows the hearts of the four elders he knows the hearts of the four deacons he knows the heart of the three staff he knows the hearts of the leadership and ministry. He knows your heart. He knows my heart. I mean, he comes to you and he personally says, I know your deeds. And not only do I know your deeds, I know your heart. So I know why you do the stuff you do. Why do we try to hide from God? I mean, holiness completed is when we realize that Jesus Christ is always here and never absent. And there's not one thing you can do that he doesn't know you're doing it, and there's not one motive in your heart that he doesn't already know why you're doing it. So, man, we come to him and we open our hearts and we lay bare our very soul, our spirit, and we say, God, you know our deeds. Now, at first, that could be a little bad news, right? But really, in the end, it's good news. Because those whom he loves, he rebukes and disciplines. So when he knows we're doing something, man, he doesn't just be quiet and surprise us at Judgment Day. He starts moving in, and he writes letters to seven churches, you know? I mean, he, he's always ready to encourage us to go on further. So in verse 8, it starts out where he says, I know your deeds. And so everybody starts trembling. I know your deeds. You know, what's next, right? Based on your knowledge of who I am, God, what's next? What are you going to say next? 
And he says, see, I have placed before you an open door. I believe that's what God said. I believe God in his, un, his, his understanding and his knowledge of who we are as a church, I think he's saying to us, see cornerstone, see cornerstone, I have placed before you an open door. Through the process of elimination and the process of observation and the continuing process of revelation, I want to believe that. I want to believe that's the church that we are. Not like we fit everything about the, the, the church in Philadelphia, but praise God, I'm just going to believe it. I'm going to believe, Lord, and if I'm wrong, if, if we're Laodicea, you know, if you're about to spit us out of your mouth, if we're Ephesus, if we've lost our first love, if, if we're Smyrna and we're believing the wrong things, God, let me know. But Father, just for today and in the days ahead, because of elimination and observation and revelation, I say before my church, the group of people that I love and, 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 and serve, Father, I, I just want to confess it. I think that we're the church of Philadelphia, and you're saying to us today, see, I have placed before you an open door. Is that all right? Is that good news? Do you want to do something significant for God? I do. <laughs> I do. That was my cry last week to you guys. As we went through 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and, and we, we looked at 600,000 people ended up dead in the wilderness. And all that was written down for our warning and our example. I don't want to be dead in the wilderness. I want to recognize the open doors. Okay, see, I place before you an open door that no one can shut. Now, let's look at what an open door is. I believe I have three definitions, and then we're going to see a short def a video that kind of says one thing I want to show you about an open door. Here, here's my first definition. It's an opportunity to do something significant with Christ. An open door is an opportunity to do something significant for Christ. Second definition, it's an opportunity given to you and I, or us as the body of Christ, it's an opportunity given to us by God to have influence for God's kingdom for Jesus Christ. But here's my best one. I, 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 this is the one I like the most. An open door is an invitation to join God in his work of redemption. It's his invitation. When we see an open door, he's saying, guys, I'm the head. You're the, say it, body. I can't, go, the head can't go through the body. I'm sorry, the head can't go through this open door. The, the head can't take advantage of this open door. The, the head can't make the most of this opportunity unless the body hears from the head and, and moves through it. Okay, is that fair? So an open door is an invitation from God Almighty who has is, is got this incredibly big plan to bring the whole world to this ending and it's an invitation to you personally to us as a corporate body it's an invitation from god to do something significant with him <laughs> oh i'm tired of doing stuff without him i'm i'm tired of to, to try to get doors to open i i just want to say god show me the door that you've opened and let me join you just remember that with him as we watch this this two-minute video. Would you do that with me, please? Amen. Life is filled with divine opportunities, but we have to learn how do you recognize them and how do you seize them? You know, the Bible is just full of stories of people who were given a divine opportunity by God but it was their response, their yes or their no, that would end up shaping their lives. For years, what I was doing was so conflicting with what my heart wanted to do. I've had a gratifying career, but I've gotten further and further away from things that really mattered to me where I thought I could make a difference. 
Everything that I had depended on was now taken away. It was me in the wilderness with God. An open door does not mean that all will be pleasant and smooth on the other side. Sometimes the open doors God wants us to go through require hardship and struggle. He meets human beings at the threshold of every open door. The magic of the open door is not the new circumstance or job or location or accomplishment. It's being with him. It was in those times of prayer that God reminded me, man, I can take care of them and I love them more than you do. You know, we are making a difference. We are able to impact them for the better. When you hear those things, it makes all the hard work all worth it. I live for changing the world where I can have an effect and help other men find the same life that I've got to live. I'm always trying to be aware that God is watching me, but I'm serving it in Jesus' name. And when it's all finished and done with, I want him to say, well done. Hey. It is a divinely opened door, a door intentionally, thoughtfully, purposefully, deliberately opened by God himself. This door is symbolic of boundless opportunities, of unimagined chances to do good, to make your life count for eternity. An open door is the great adventure of life because it means the possibility of doing something that's actually useful to the God of eternity. Amen. Amen. I like that because it, it shows you that God's going to open doors where you are. He's going to open collective doors for a church, but he's going to open doors in your manufacturing facility. He's going to open doors in your school. He's going to open doors for you. And this is the one point that I thought was neat. It came about halfway through the thing. He said, that an open door is an opportunity that you get to be, that, that you get to do something with God. Man, that's where I want to be. Amen? That's where I want to be. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. It's an invitation, an open door in your life is an invitation to join God in his work. Three verses just to let you know that open door is a concept in scripture. The first verse is 1 Corinthians 16 verse 8 and 9. Let's look at this. This is Paul writing to the Corinthians and he says, but I will stay on at Ephesus until Pentecost because a great door for effective work has opened to me. Now, a great door for effective work has opened to me. Did he open the door? No. God opens doors. He was available. Amen? And he was going to stay on. I mean, he had just did his life, right? To take advantage of an open door. A great door for effective work has been opened to me, and there are many who oppose me. Now, wait a minute, Lord. If you're going to open a door and still have many in opposition, probably, you know, <laughs> Amen. Don't expect everything to be roses just because you and God are going through an open door. I mean, when the devil hears that a church or an individual is recognizing open doors, I mean, there's going to be opposition. And in this verse, he says, man, there are many against me, but I'm staying here because I've got an open door. I've got an opportunity to go with God and make a difference in this world. And if I could say something, it, I hope is in the very core of our heart, in the very core of our church, is I think we want to make a difference. I think we don't just want to sit in a pew, and, 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 and uh, I think we want to be encouraged and built up and become a mature church, not blown and tossed by the waves, not blown here and there by every wind of doctrine, but to grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. And as we do that, we can go through open doors. So the second verse we could look at is, is uh, Colossians 4.3. And, and, and this, is, uh, this is interesting because it says, And pray for us, too, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. So, you know, we can pray for an open door. God, open a door. And, and let me be there to see it. So I, I and, and then I, um, I guess we didn't look at Acts 14, 21. I'm sorry, I got a little bit out of order there. Acts 14, 21, a third verse. On arriving there, now 
this verse is the finishing of Paul's first missionary journey. And man, he'd been traveling for months, and now he comes back to the home church to give a report. So on arriving there, they gathered the church together and reported all that God had done through them and how he had, would you say that for me, opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. So, open doors. I think we have some opportunities in front of us. I think we have an opportunity for worship. I think we have an opportunity for God to use worship. I, 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 I feel like it's, it's something that he's done over many years in our life. I, I, I was talking to a worship leader in another church last night at your son's uh, beautiful party. And uh, I was just thankful that I, I think there's a culture of worship at Cornerstone. And I think God's going to use that. He's going to open doors. Missions. I think we have some opportunities in missions in the Muslim world, in Cambodia, India, Africa, South Africa, in the abortion-minded woman. I think there's some open doors. in uh, Down there by Krispy Kreme Donuts through Cody East Church. I mean, I see every one of those as an open door. I, I think we have an open door in prisons. I, we have an opportunity to go into East Baton Rouge Parish, West Baton Rouge Parish, and two prisons in Mississippi. I, I see an open door into the hearts of babies, toddlers, children, and youth. And, and that's, that's something that not every, God, God has given us. I mean, I don't know why children come to church with a big smile on their face at Cornerstone. But it's just something that happens. I mean, I, it, it's, it's, it's us being friendly and us loving them. But I, I believe, I really believe we have an open door into the hearts of children. And I know that our staff, Amanda and Austin, Tori and Chase and Paige and all of her workers, I, I, I want to encourage them that God has opened a door into the hearts of our children. I believe that we have an open door into the hearts of young families right now it was interesting uh, at this uh, thing that i was at for the um, persics uh, caleb is going to marry a lady named heather caleb is their son and i had 15 minutes to share with the worship leader from another church and i said well tell me about your church you know because would you would it be a compliment i mean i, I like if you look at brother dick and you look at caleb i mean you'd say, well, Caleb's a little younger dresser and a little edgy, you know, and he uses different terminology and his illustrations. Kind of, you understand what I'm saying? And that's a compliment. I'm glad we got a Caleb. And I'm glad we got a brother Dick. Well, this guy was, yeah, kind of like Caleb squared. <laughs> and and I, I said, well, well, tell me about your church. Because I was thinking, man, I mean, if this is the worship leader, you know. Um, and he said, well, he said, actually, I guess I could describe our church. They kind of look like you, all tucked in. Y'all understand that? All tucked in. Tucked in, hair combed, you know. <laughs> well, this is what I thought. This is what I thought. We have an open door into those people that are not tucked in. And we have an open door into those people that are tucked in. I mean, the one thing I see around here is, and, and what new people tell me is, man, we got ooh, uh, older people and younger people. And, and I, I, I don't want to be in a church where it's just like everybody's young. I want old. I want young. I want all people. So <laughs> tucked in or not tucked in, amen? I, 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 maybe I should tell them. I, I was in there praying and studying for, for today, and, and I was sitting at my desk, and I have a drawer right there, and, and my, I don't know how this happened, but my shirt got stuck in the drawer. And, and so I'm, I'm, I'm kind of real easily pulling this drawer out because it, the button had got stuck right there, so I'm just, I didn't have a key to that drawer, you know, and, and it was stuck, so I couldn't open it up. And I kept pulling harder and harder, and it just busted the button. That's how I got it open. So I'm standing before you unbuttoned, and if that stands for untucked, you know, maybe we're moving in the right direction. You know, your old pastor, okay. 
but but I'm, I'm telling you, man, we got an open door to Central. Now, I'm not saying that Zachary doesn't, isn't open to us. And, man, I love everybody from Zachary, okay? And I love everybody from Livingston Parish. And I love everybody here that lives in Baker. But, I mean, our, our mayor is a Christian man. I, I, I know that. He's given us his testimony in our pastor's meeting. I mean, he is a born-again Christian. And he wants Central to be a Christian-like city. Uh, our school superintendent, Mike Falk, man, he is a born-again Christian attending Greenville Springs Baptist Church. The, the head of the um, um, Chamber of Commerce is a guy named Ron Erickson. Well, his, his, uh, he, he doubles as a pastor of, of, a, of a church here in Central. And, and, and I, I, just, I think we have open doors in Central. And, and man, I, I want to be used of God to see open doors where, where central can be touched. I, but this is why, where I want to focus for a minute. I'll open door in your world. Amen. God wants to open doors in your world and he wants to use you to go through those doors in faith. If you don't hear anything else from this message, man, I want you to know that God has placed before you some open doors. And in the future, he's going to open some doors. And the doors that he opens, nobody can shut. And the doors that he shuts, nobody can open. So, Lord, give us the understanding to recognize when a door is shut, I can't open it. And when a door is open, I need to, with you, go through it. Is that fair? Okay. Now, I ask if I could use this illustration. Is it, David, uh, David, did I not ask if I could use this illustration? Okay. So, here we go. You ready? Yeah, I'm really, Brother Dick. What else can I say? I mean, you're in front of 200 people. So he's this, like, administrator at um, the hospital, the hospital, uh, Baton Rouge General Blue Bonnet. And like all hospitals, right, I mean, you know that Baton Rouge, Florida, is closing the emergency room, and, and Baton Rouge General is overall going through all these changes, and there's organizational changes, and there's structural changes, it's, I, I hear that from everybody. I mean, that's kind of like the world today, right? I mean, everything's changing. But it, so changes are in introducing difficulty at the hospital. Am I accurate so far? It's a hard environment. It's a difficult environment. How many of you find yourself in a difficult environment out there in the world? Come on. Anybody? Okay. So David is working in that environment, and he gets a summons to, the, to his boss's office. And the boss sits him down and says, David, why are you so happy all the time? In light of what's happening in the hospital, nobody could act like that. Accurate so far? And David says, drug test me. Now, I'm sure it wasn't exactly like, I'm, but th that's the point. The circumstances around David were so difficult, and he had to face the reality of those circumstances, but he had a joy in his heart. And those are the kind of things that, that enable us to go through those open doors. Amen. So, David, I'm here to say, man, I believe God's going to open a lot of doors in that hospital. <laughs> I believe he's going to, and, and what he opens, nobody's going to shut. And, and I, I just want you to close your eyes uh, right now. And I just, as your pastor and your friend and your brother in Christ, your co-laborer in the Lord Jesus for the glory of the kingdom of God, I want to say, God, we want to, we, we want to have eyes to see where you're opening doors and, and we want to have faith to join you in your invitation to make a big difference for Jesus Christ as we go through that open door. Lord, we're excited that you call us and to, to be your partner. It's unbelievable. So, God, by your spirit, open doors. By your spirit, open doors and give us faith to walk in those doors. So I believe there's many open doors. I just uh, continue for a minute in verse 8. We need to just cover one other little thing. Uh, he says this of the church. He says this in verse 8. He says, I know your deeds, 
I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Let me make a few comments on that. I know that you have little strength. I guess he's talking about there, and I've read a little bit about what that would mean. You don't have many finances, Philadelphia. You might have lower class type people, Philadelphia. You don't have much worldly power is what they're saying. In other words, you're not like this big impressive thing that, boy, if I was going to choose somebody to open a door in front of, I'd choose him, you know, or I'd choose that church. I mean, you know, and he says to them, you don't have little, you have little strength. And, and that just encourages me because I kind of feel like Cornerstone. I mean, man, really, we just, we, we don't have a big budget. We don't have a bunch of rich people. We don't have a bunch of CEOs of corporations. You know, I, I guess Dewey would be close to that. <laughs> I just thought I'd say that. He's the principal of a school in Zachary. I'm proud of that. Amen. <laughs> I'm proud that God has exalted him to that place where he can have much influence for Jesus Christ. But not many. Look what God said about the Corinthian church. He said, not many of you are wise by human standards. Not many really influential. Not many of noble birth. And then he goes on to say, God chooses the foolish, the weak, the lowly, and the despised so that nobody can boast. So when God says to the Philadelphian church, you have little strength. I think he's saying that's us. The ladies are studying Gideon. Gideon was the weakest of his clan, and his clan was the smallest of the nation of Israel. God chose Gideon and he reduced his army from 32,000 down to 10,000 down to 3,000. So when they won the victory, nobody would boast that our power, our strength has done it. So I, I say, Lord, we're of little strength, and I'm glad. Because I don't want to boast, and you do something neat through us. Yay, little strength. Because here's where our strength is. Read a little bit more in that passage. Yet, you have little strength. Yet, you've kept my word, and you've not denied my name. He's not work looking for people with great strength. He's just looking for people who will keep his word. And not deny his name. And I look out over here and I say, man, yeah. I, I, and again, if you feel like I'm boasting, bragging, let me have it, man. Really let me have it. And I, before you, welcome God. I believe this church has not denied his name. And I believe we're trying to the best of our ability by his grace and through the power of the Holy Spirit to keep because we meet all the qualifications. <laughs> we got little strength, but we're keeping his word and we're not denying his name. And I think that's where you need to be right now. Let not the wise man boast about his wisdom. Let not the strong man boast about his strength. Let not the rich man boast about his riches, it says in Jeremiah, but let him who boasts boast about this, that he understands. Lord, that's our boast today, that we understand and know you. Your part in this message, keep God's word. Don't deny his name. Pray for your leaders in your church, the elders, the deacons, the staff, the ministry leaders, that we would have our eyes open to open doors and to be ready to go forward. Pray for yourself that God would open doors around you, give you eyes to see. And then enable you to make the most of every opportunity. I close with just a quick story about an open door. In 1974, Jackie and I were in our house in Shreveport. A guy knocked on our door. I don't even know why, how. It surprised me. I opened the door. I let him in. He led me and my wife to Jesus Christ. I close this open door message with an open door. God wants to make sure everybody is safe. He desires for you to be a Christian and to be safe. And he says this, I stand at the door of your heart and I knock. If any man opens the door, 
See, there's the only door that we're kind of allowed to open, right? He's out there opening doors, but the only door that we can open is the door that enables him to come in, right? Let's make sure that all of us just open that door, welcome Jesus Christ into our lives. We're saved. We're filled with the Spirit. We're moving toward open doors to be with him to accomplish something great in our world today. Lord, come right now as we close this service, Father God. Come and move by your Spirit in a strong and special way. Do things, Lord, that I can't do or that we can't do, but only you can do. So, Father, we just welcome your presence in these next few minutes as we sing a song. Come and touch our hearts. Solidify this open door word in our mind. In Jesus' name. Would you stand with me, church? Would you stand with me? Would you stand with me? We're just going to sing. Church, would you receive the word? Would you just raise your hand and say, I receive the word. Give me eyes to see, feet to run swiftly, to join you in that open door. Church, the song we're going to sing is written by Cornerstone. An open door music could go to the ends of the earth. Amen. You sing.